So the reason why um, you're here this evening, or you're watching on the video at least, is you know, dual polarization radar. It was introduced in the National Weather Service within the last three to five years, depending upon where you were uh, and which radar you used as sort of your home radar. And the big thing that was discussed with the introduction of dual pole is identifying precip types. Where is there snow? Where is there sleet? Uh, rain, liquid, hail, uh, non-meteorological scatters, things like that. Um, and of course, that's a huge benefit to what we have uh, in terms of our near-cast capabilities in the Weather Service and abroad in media, emergency management, others uh, in the enterprise, the weather enterprise. But the big thing, the coolest part you can get out of this is not just the precip identification saying, well, this is sleet, this is snow, but using that information to tell you how is a storm evolving. And so that's why I put here that the better precip identification provides insight into the storm evolution. By having that idea of where different precipitation particles are, where they're moving, you can get an idea of how a storm is evolving. Is it strengthening? Is it weakening? And so that's the big focus of all these little video clips and presentations is you can get an idea from each signature what a storm is doing. And that's the big power behind dual polar radar. So we have our different precipitation types as we show up here. And then we elucidate them with the radar. And so again, at first glance, better precip type IDing is what we have as a benefit. But what's even more powerful, as we discussed, is that you reveal storm trends via these identifications. And that's really the thrust of these uh, lectures, of these training sessions of this evening, is that you can gather so much information, much more information about what a storm is doing based upon the dual pole data. So what are we talking about with dual pole, the basics? Imagine, hey, we're out on a storm chase right now, and we've already stumbled upon a pretty nice uh, thunderstorm here. So we also are able to build a radar really rapidly, too, while we're at it, an S-band radar at that, too, which is amazing. So we send out this wave, this pulse of energy from the radar. And you can see how it's wiggling. It's in the horizontal. That's what we call a horizontal polarization. And so data we get from that is reflectivity. We all know reflectivity. We love it. We look at it all the time. We get that from that horizontal wiggle. We get velocity data. So that tells us, again, where maybe we need to be looking for perhaps a couplet, perhaps strong straight line winds, things like that. And we also get what's known as spectrum width. And a few of you, maybe all of you, have heard of spectrum width. But it gives us an idea of how much within a radar range bin uh, the winds, the velocities maybe are varying. And so those are sort of the basic moments that we get with that horizontal polarization. And that was the conventional single polarization radar that we had before the introduction of dual polarization. So as you may suspect, the term dual pole, we add a different wiggle. We add a wiggle and oscillation in the vertical. And so that's the vertical polarization. Now by comparing these two polarizations, we get something known as differential reflectivity. So we're comparing the power we get in that horizontal wiggle to the power we get back from the vertical wiggle. So it tells us something about the shape of precipitation we're looking at. Correlation coefficient, as we'll see in a little bit, tells us something about how diverse the precipitation particles are, and also something known as specific differential phase, KDP. And we'll explain that a little more in depth coming up, but it gives us an idea of how much liquid perhaps we're dealing with when we're looking at a particular radar range bin. So let's imagine here for a second, we focus on this one part of the storm. And there is our nice, very uh, pristine, oblate spheroid, that's the scientific term, but basically our hamburger bun shaped raindrop. And so our horizontal wave comes in, and we get the horizontal component. The, axis, the horizontal axis of the raindrop is lit up, illuminated, if you will. We get information about that. And then we send our vertical wave in, and then we illuminate the vertical axis. And so that gives us information in the vertical. And that all together gives us more info about the shape, the orientation, the phase, the diversity of precipitation particles. And with all this, we can learn a lot more about how a storm is evolving. So when we look at reflectivity, what we first discussed in the horizontal, what does it tell us? So our scale, as we know and love in dBZ, how much stuff is there? How much precipitation is there? How big is it? We're dealing with big hailstones, little raindrops, or perhaps non-meteorological scatters. And how reflective is it? Is it a wet hailstone, sends a lot of energy back to the radar? Or is it maybe a light, fluffy, not so dense uh, snow aggregate, which doesn't really want to send much back to the radar? So things like hail. Heavy rain, higher reflectivity, hail especially, 60, 70 dBZ plus. Although, as you'll see in one of the other uh, PowerPoint presentations we have, one of the other presentations coming up, 
Hail doesn't necessarily have to fall in dBz greater than 60. Um, we can see it at much lower dBzs, and we'll show that in a different presentation on large hail growth. And then we go all the way down to light rain, closer to 10 to 20 dBz. Then when we're dealing with winter precipitation, you can think of a wet, melting, dense, heavy snow as maybe somewhere in the region, region of 40 to 50 dBz at a maximum. Uh, sometimes lower, closer to 30 to 35, and then as you go to more of a light, fluffy, moderate snow, closer to 10 to 20 dBz. So now when we talk about differential reflectivity, what is the scale first off we're dealing with? Well, it's in something called dB, and it goes both from negative to positive, generally in the range, when we're looking at it with meteorological scatters, especially in the range of about negative 2 to 5, somewhere in there. And so what does it tell us? The shape of the precipitation particles, uh, are they wider than they are tall? Are they taller than they are wide? How are they oriented? Are they tilted to the right, tilted to the left? We call that canting. Um, are they tumbling? Information like that. So when we look at some raindrops or perhaps a melting hailstone or these nice uh, pristine dendrites, these snow crystals, we see more in the horizontal than we do in the vertical. And what does that give us then? That gives us positive ZDR. So things that have more energy sent back in the horizontal than the vertical, we get positive ZDR uh, with these anywhere from 2, 3, 4, 5 dB. As we go to more spherical objects, so small raindrops, uh, hailstones, dry hailstones that are nice and spherical, or clumps of snowflakes, what we call snow aggregates, those then come closer to zero dB because we get similar amounts of energy in the horizontal and the vertical. Now, if we were to be dealing with anything that gives you more energy back in the vertical than the horizontal, that's when we could actually get into negative differential reflectivity. So when we're dealing with correlation coefficient, our next variable, what is that telling us? Well, there's our scale. It's a correlation, so it ranges uh, from 1 farther down to uh, values as low as 0.3 even. But when we get to that low, we're dealing with things, as you'll see in a second, that are non-meteorological. But what is it telling us? How diverse are the precip types in a radar sample? Is it a mixture? Do we have melting going on? Or is it pure? Do we have just raindrops? Are there non-meteorological echoes? That's one of the biggest uses with correlation coefficient. Is it telling us something where we are not looking at meteorological scatters, per, but perhaps tornadic debris? So when we're looking at the relative values, pure rain or pure snow tends to have very high CC, 0.95 upwards to about 0.99 or even 1. When we're dealing with a melting uh, precipitation type, melting snow, for instance, where there's a mixture of snow and raindrops or melting hail, we start to see lower correlation coefficient, maybe 0.9 or lower. When we start to deal with things like giant hailstones, if some of you have seen hailstones, the way they can get weird lobes and spikes on them when they start to get really big, those different shapes are very diverse, or you get a very diverse sample uh, in the radar range bin. And so when you see that, what it gives you is much lower values of correlation coefficient. Also, especially if you start to see some of these bigger sizes where maybe you're dealing with hailstones two inches plus, that can drive correlation coefficient downward uh, as low as 0 0.85, 0 0.8, even below 0 0.8. And then when you get down into those blue colors, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, even lower, that's non-meteorological. For instance, we can see birds. Birds show up all the time as uh, these low correlation coefficient scatters on radar. It can also be things a little more insidious, like tornadic debris, but we want to know where that is, of course, on radar. The next thing is specific differential phase, and this is maybe one of the ones, it's not used quite as frequently by operational forecasters, but there's a lot of power in it, and so we're going to explain it here and in some of the modules coming up, uh, what you can do with it. So what are we trying to back out of it, and what does it mean? Well, we measure it in something called degrees per kilometer, at least, and these are the values that typically we tend to see on radar, anywhere from about zero degrees per kilometer upward to about six degrees per kilometer. And what is it we're measuring? What does it mean? Well, it tells you how much liquid water often is present in a thunderstorm, and then it can tell you things like uh, how well are snow crystals growing aloft in a winter storm? That's something we're interested in. Are we getting heavy snow? Are we interested in the potential for heavy snow? We want to know how well the ice crystals are growing aloft, and so it can reveal information about that. So, for instance, if we imagine lots of melting hail, that can give us really high values of specific differential phase, five to six degrees per kilometer. Moderate rain, a little bit less than that, and then crystal growth aloft is confined to generally a small range, about 0 to 0.5, and even in some extreme instances of heavy snow, maybe 1 degree per kilometer. But we'll see how we can use that. So what's this whole degrees per kilometer talk? What are we dealing with? So if we imagine several uh, big raindrops, for instance, and we send in our two waves. We have our vertical wave and our horizontal wave. And you notice what happens when they reach them. We have more liquid in the horizontal 
the bigger raindrops are, they tend to get what's known as, uh, again, oblate in terms of the description of it. So they have a wider horizontal or a larger horizontal axis than they do a vertical axis. And so the horizontal wave runs into more stuff. It runs into more liquid than the vertical wave does. And what does this do? It slows the horizontal wave down relative to the vertical wave. So we'll watch that again. How the vertical one continues faster, the horizontal one slows down relative to it because it's running into more stuff, more liquid, than the vertical wave is because of these wider uh, raindrops. And so the measure of degrees per kilometer is telling us how much that horizontal wave, or in the case of negative KDP, how much the vertical wave is slowing down relative to the other. And you can see then the more rain we have there, the more liquid, especially with these bigger drops, the more it's going to slow relative to the other. So that can tell us how much liquid there is by the amount of specific differential phase we see. And so that's what we're getting at when we talk about differential phase. So those are the operational applications, or at least uh, a look behind the tools that we're going to use for the operational applications in our first video here. And you want to know that each variable is a puzzle piece. You have all these different puzzle pieces scattered about when we're dealing with dual pole radar. The more you consider, the better you're going to get in terms of the picture. You start to put in more puzzle pieces. You start to see more clearly what is actually going on with a winter storm, a thunderstorm, regular old rainfall, or something else. So if you consider more, you'll get a better idea. But the one thing we're going to reiterate throughout these presentations is you got to ask yourself always if your diagnosis makes sense. If it's uh, 60 degrees outside and you see low ZDR, you probably don't want to be thinking there's snow aggregates because it's probably melting uh, well before reaching the ground aloft. <laughs>